Hi, I'm Peter J. Shield. Welcome to my world of unexplained mysteries, Vegas style. Death shall come on swift wings to him who disturbs the peace of the king. Supposedly engraved on the exterior of King Tutankhamun's tomb. King Tutankhamun was only 19 when he died, perhaps murdered by his enemies. His tomb, in comparison with his contemporaries, was modest. After his death, his successors made an attempt to delete his memory by removing his name from all the official records, even those carved in stone. As it turns out, his enemy's efforts only ensured his eventual fame. He's lovingly referred to as King Tut. The ancient Egyptians revered their pharaohs as gods. Upon their death, the kings were buried, carefully preserved by embalming. The mummified corpses were interned in elaborate tombs, like the Great Pyramid, and surrounded with all the riches the royals would need in the next life. The tombs were then carefully sealed. Egypt's best architects designed the structures to resist the thieves. In some cases, heavy, hard granite plugs were used to block the passageways. In others, false doorways and hidden rooms were designed to fool the intruders. Finally, in a few cases, a curse was placed on the entrance. Most of these precautions failed. In ancient times, grave robbers found their way into the tombs. They unsealed the doors, chiseled their way around the plugs, and found the secrets of the hidden rooms. They stripped the dead kings of their valuables. We will never know if any of the thieves suffered the wrath of the curse. Here are just a few authentic curses from various mummies' tombs. Firstly, as for anyone who shall enter this tomb in his impurity, I shall wring his neck as a bird's. And then again, as for any man who shall destroy these, it is the God Troth who shall destroy him. And finally, as for him who shall destroy this inscription, he shall not reach his home, he shall not embrace his children, he shall not see success. Archaeologists from Europe became very interested in Egypt in the 19th century. They uncovered the old tombs and explored their deep recesses, always hoping to find that one forgotten crypt that had not been plundered in antiquity. They knew that the pharaohs had been buried with untold treasures that would be of immense artistic, scientific, and monetary value. Always the archaeologists were disappointed. In 19, no, sorry, 1891, a young Englishman named Howard Carter arrived in Egypt. Over the years, he became convinced there, that there was at least one undiscovered tomb, that of the almost unknown king, Tutankhamun. Carter found a backer for his tomb search in the wealthy Lord Carnarvon, and for five years Carter's dug, looking for the missing pharaoh, and found nothing. How many of us today would endure a fruitless search for that length of time? Carnarvon summoned Carter to England in 1922 to tell him he was calling off the search. Carter managed to talk Carnarvon into supporting him for one more season. Returning to Egypt, the archaeologist brought with him a yellow canary. A golden bird, Carter's foreman exclaimed. It will lead us to the tomb. Perhaps it did. On November the 4th, 1922, Carter's workmen discovered a step cut into the rock. It had been hidden by the debris left over from the building of the tomb of Ramesses IV. Digging further, they found 15 more 
leading to an ancient doorway that appeared to be still sealed. On the doorway was the name Tutankhamun. When Carter arrived home that night, his servant met him at the door, clutching in his hands a few yellow feathers. His eyes large with fear, he reported that the canary had been killed by a cobra. Carter, a practical man, told the servant to make sure the snake was out of the house. The man grabbed Carter by the sleeve. The pharaoh serpent ate the bird because it led us to the hidden tomb. You must not disturb the tomb. Scoffing at such superstitious nonsense, Carter sent the man home. Carter immediately sent a telegram to Carnarvon in England and waited anxiously for his arrival. Carnarvon made it to Egypt by November 26th and watched as Carter made a hole in the door. leaning in, holding a candle to take a look. Behind him, Lord Carnarvon asked, can you see anything? And Carter answered, yes, wonderful things. The day the tomb was opened was one of joy and celebration for all those involved. Nobody seemed to be concerned about any curse. Rumors circulated later that Carter had found a tablet with the curse inscribed on it, but hid it immediately so it wouldn't alarm his workers. Carter, of course, denied doing so. We'll be back in a moment with the curse of the Pharaoh. Tutankhamun's tomb was intact and contained an amazing collection of treasures, including a stone sarcophagus. The sarcophagus contained three gold coffins nestled within each other. Inside the final one was the mummy of the boy king pharaoh Tutankhamun. Come with me now as we explore the tomb just as it was when Howard Carter discovered it on that November day in 1922. Tutankhamun's tomb is located in the Valley of the Kings, between the tombs of Ramesses II and Ramesses IV. Although robbers probably entered the tomb at least twice in antiquity, its contents were virtually intact when it was discovered by Howard Carter. The design of Tutankhamun's tomb is typical of that of the kings of the 18th dynasty. At the entrance to the tomb, there's a flight of stairs leading to a short corridor. The first room is the antechamber, where many of the household items for Tutankhamun's voyage to eternity were found. Off this room is an annex, and at the far end is an opening that leads to the burial chamber. This chamber was guarded by two black century statues that represent the royal car or soul and symbolize the hope of rebirth, the qualities of Osiris who was reborn after he died. The burial chamber contains Tutankhamun's sarcophagus its walls are painted with scenes of Tutankhamun in the afterworld. The ritual of the opening the mouth to give life to the deceased. The solar bark on which one travels to the afterworld. And Tutankhamun's car in the presence of Osiris. Off the burial chamber 
is the treasury room where a magnificent gilded canoptic shrine was found. This was the most impressive object in the treasury. And these are the words of Howard Carter as he described what he saw when he first looked in to the treasury. Facing the doorway on the far side stood the most beautiful monument that I have ever seen. So lovely it, it made one gasp with wonder and admiration. The central portion of it consisted of a large shrine shaped chest completely overlaid with gold and surmounted by a cornice of sacred cobras. Surrounding this freestanding were statues of four goddesses with outstretched protective arms, so natural and so lifelike in their pose, so pitiful and compassionate, the expression on their faces that one felt it almost sacrilege to look at them. A gold chest held four canoptic jars containing the dead pharaoh's internal organs, lungs, stomach, intestines and liver. The four goddesses protected the shrine. Neath to the north, Circus to the south, Isis to the west and Nephis to the east. Also found in the room were 35 model boats and a statue of Anubis, a god represented as having the head of a jackal. For conservation purposes, all these treasures have been removed to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. So much for the tomb itself, but what of the curse? A few months after the tomb's opening, tragedy struck. Lord Carnarvon, 57, was taken ill and rushed to Cairo. He died a few days later. The exact cause of death was not known, but it seemed to be from an infection started by an insect bite, probably a mosquito. Legend has it that when he died, there was a short power failure and all the lights throughout Cairo went out. His son reported that back at his estate of Highclere in England, his favorite dog howled and suddenly dropped dead. Even more strange, when the mummy of Tutankhamun was unwrapped in 1925, it was found to have a wound on the left cheek in the same exact position as the insect bite on Carnarvon that led to his death. By 1929, 11 people connected with the discovery of the tomb had died early and of unnatural causes. This included two of Carnarvon's relatives, Carter's personal secretary, Richard Bethel, and Bethel's father, Lord Westbury. Westbury killed himself by jumping from a building. He left a note that read, I really cannot stand any more horrors and hardly see what good I'm doing here, so I'm making my exit. Outside the tomb of King Tut, shortly after it was opened in 1922, what horrors did Westbury refer to? The press followed the deaths carefully, attributing each new one to the mummy's curse. By 1935, they credited 21 victims to King Tut. Was there really a curse, or was it all just the ravings of a sensational press? Herbert E. Winlock, the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, made his own calculations about the effectiveness of the curse. According to Winlock's figures, of the 22 people present when the tomb was opened in 1922, only six had died by 1934. Of the 22 people present at the opening of the sarcophagus in 1924, only two died in the following 10 years. Also, 
Ten people were there when the mummy was unwrapped in 1925. They all survived until at least 1934. In 2002, a medical scholar at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, named Mark Nelson, he completed a study which purportedly showed that the curse of King Tut never really existed. Nelson selected 44 Westerners in Egypt at the time the tomb was discovered. Of these, 25 of the group were people potentially exposed to the curse, either because they were at the breaking of the sacred seals in the tomb, or at the opening of the sarcophagus, or at the opening of the coffins, or the unwrapping of the mummy. The study showed that these exposures had no effect on the length of their survival when compared to those who were not exposed. Perhaps the power of a curse is in the mind of the person who believes in it. Howard Carter, the man who actually opened the tomb, never believed in the curse and lived to a reasonably old age of 66 before dying of entirely natural causes. A rational explanation? Several people have suggested that illnesses associated with the ancient Egyptian tombs may have a rational explanation based in biology. A doctor at Cairo University examined the records of museum workers and noticed that many of them had been exposed to a, a, a virus, a fungus called a, a Spiragellus nigra, a fungus that caused fever, fatigue and rashes. He suggested that the fungus might have been able to survive in the tombs for thousands of years and then was picked up by archaeologists when they entered the tombs. An Italian physician identified another possible fungus at Egyptian archaeolog uh, archaeological sites and suggested it might also have made visitors to the tombs or even those that just handled artifacts from the tombs sick. This particular fungus has not been shown to be fatal, however. In 1999, a German microbiologist, Gotthard Kramer from the University of Leipzig, analyzed 40 mummies and identified several potentially dangerous mold spores on each. Mold spores are tough and can survive thousands of years, even in a dark, dry tomb. Although most are harmless, a few can be toxic. Kramer thinks that when the tombs were first opened and fresh air gushed inside, these spores could easily have blown up into the air. When spores enter the body through the nose, mouth, or eye uh, membranes, he added, they can lead to organ failure or even death, particularly in individuals with weakened immune systems. For this reason, archaeologists now wear protective gear, such as masks and gloves, when unwrapping a mummy. Something explorers from the days of Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon didn't do. So was the curse of the mummy nothing more than a mold spore? Or was it all media hype? Or is there perhaps another explanation? I'm Peter J. Shield. Thanks for watching.